Now, I can't tell you enough how, I can't share with you enough how appreciative I am of this next guest to come on up here and speak. Daniel Viella had reached out to us and said, hey Gary, you know, I believe in what you're doing in the Zero Prototype, and I'd like to find a way to be a part of your conference. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome to the, stand, the stage Daniel Viella from General Motors, who's gonna to talk to you about General Motors' journey to 100% virtual. Folks, good afternoon. So I guess uh, uh, my uh, Murray's presentation was more talking about the journey that brought us here where we are today in terms of technology. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the challenges that we have moving forward. We are a GM, one of the OEMs that is clearly pointing that we want to eliminate prototypes in our development process. And uh, uh, I'd like to share some of the opportunities that we have along the way, some of the challenges that we're going to have to face too. Uh, I guess th this is something that we started at GM about uh, four or five years ago, uh, the conversation that uh, some of you might have heard about Vision 2025, and uh, I prefer to use the, the, the terminology here, 100% virtual, because that's the direction that we're going. And uh, th one of the first things that we had to do is really to define what 100% virtual is, because reality is our product is very physical at the end of the day. So w what does that really mean? And that's what this slide is trying to bring. So, uh, well, why we are doing this? Well, we want to move faster. We want to be able to develop our products in a much faster development cycle. Uh, we want to do better engineering. We truly believe that by means of uh, modeling the vehicle in the right amount of detail to understand how the physics works, we're going to be able to do that. And uh, we want to be able to increase our throughput. We want to do more variants. We want to develop more vehicles with the same amount of resources that we have today. Um, what is that? Well, the first important definition here, the first vehicle is good enough to sell. Does it mean that it is going to be the refined vehicle that we're going to be putting in the hands of our customers? No. We are going to have still the opportunity to develop uh, and refine calibration and tuning in a real vehicle, uh, physically speaking, but we're going to be requiring much less time with that vehicle. And uh, the first uh, vehicle that we put on the road is already the quality that's good enough to sell to our customers. We don't learn with hardware. That's critical for this vision to be, uh, be real here. Uh, if we are really eliminating prototypes, and if you are really moving straight to final production tooling, we don't have time to react. We're gonna have a very short period of time with the vehicle. We have to confirm what we designed for. I guess like a, in the example that was just shared here, well, we cre the, 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 they created five different calibrations virtually and they just confirm which one was best uh, in, the, in, the, in the physical vehicle. This is the kind of view that we have for the future here. And driving re rigorous engineering up front here. We need to uh, understand that everything that we do today in a physical part is in scope for this vision. So uh, some of the key aspects here. Um, we have to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, consider that at, at, at move away from a correlation standpoint like uh, we have to remember that anything that we do in a prototype, in a lab, or in a proving ground is somehow an abstraction or a condensation of the real customer experience out there. There is no way that we can test in a physical domain every single possible outcome that the customer will be exposed to. We have to do that uh, uh, in a, today we are restrained by the physical elements that we build and the, 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 the labs and the proving grounds that we have, uh, we don't need to put that restraint in the virtual domain. We can do possibly more. We can scan more roads, roads that no longer exist. We can still use them to develop our vehicles. Uh, we need to create new capability while we are developing products. So this is a question that I always face that, well, we'd like to develop this, but prove to me that the capability is there and then we're gonna start developing. Well, but there's no chance on doing this because if we wait until we have everything ready to go and only then start applying the concept to develop new vehicles, we're never gonna get there or, or it's gonna take us much longer to get there. So we have to develop this kind of capability on the fly. And last thing here, use harder to confirm and validate not to find unknowns. This is a big challenge here. Today we get a physical vehicle, we drive it around, we find uh, the vehicle tells us some things that we didn't necessarily ask and react to those things. 
We're going to have to find alternatives to do that in the virtual domain. This is one of the biggest challenges. How do we uh, work with unknown uh, situations, like uh, uh, what kinds of questions we have to ask our virtual models or what kind of scenarios we have to expose the drivers in the driving the loop scenario so that we can comprehend everything that we'll be uh, interested in exposing the vehicle to for development. Um, some things are required here. So like simulation tools, what is required for moving to 100%? Needs to be fast. I mean, we, we cannot afford uh, building virtual models that will require months of crafting and fine tuning of the model to get us where we need. Uh, we need to move away from uh, modeling being kind of a concept of art where each piece is unique and tailored for a specific use and more thinking about the, 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 the kind of the dynamics of a manufacturing plant or a, a prototype operation, a PPO operation, where you're building the virtual assets and you are using them directly. So we, we, we really need to get this kind of speed in the process here. Second thing here in terms of tool, we have to have robust solvers, robust tools. We cannot afford having tools that folks have to spend time having the tool to run the model. This is still in some areas something that we need to, to work on, but in order to fully implement this vision here, we, we really need tools that get the right answer the first time. Um, Real-time capability, obviously, if you're talking about simulators here, that's pretty critical. Um, it's uh, not uh, necessarily a hard restraint for everything that can be done virtually, but if you're doing anything that involves a human in the loop, you're gonna need real time. If you're not needing a new human in the loop, you might be doing a, a large DOE, a large variation study to understand multiple scenarios of objective metrics, you still benefit from real time, you still benefit from even faster than real time in that case. And uh, last here, lower entry barrier. So the idea that that we have, this is part of GM's vision, is that the folks that have experience developing vehicles using hardware, they're gonna bring that experience to develop the, the, the great vehicles that we have on the road using virtual tools. So we need to have tools that are easy to use, easy to teach, and uh, that we can have, in this case, much more kind of a, a much larger user base. Talking about user base here, in GM, uh, as, uh, as a, the, the case here, we have around 100 engineers doing multi-body development work today between noise and vibration and vehicle dynamics. You're gonna say, well, it's a lot of people. Well, it is, but we have two things here that are important. A lot of rotation these days. So the times when folks would start in a job and spent their entire careers doing the same kind of work, those are gone. We have to deal with the reality that we have new folks coming all the time and we have a, a, a good rotation of individuals in the, in the virtual development teams. Our estimate here is that about 20% of our users inside of the CAA teams are new every single year. And most importantly, if we really want to enable the, the full uh, version of the 100% virtual uh, development here, we're gonna have to have folks that are currently using hardware either on the road or in the lab to start using those tools. So then in this case, the user base is tenfold that much. And all of this requires tools that are very easy to use, very easy to share. Um, we have this concept of co-simulation integration here uh, where we have the, uh, the, the, this figure of the individual that is possibly in this case a, a, a CAE expert that is gonna be putting together the pieces that will compose the fully integrated virtu uh, virtual vehicle. So it is part of that is the physics of what's going on. So like kinematics and compliance of the suspension and the steering systems. Uh, you, you can have models that will kind of uh, 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 model the behavior of sensors and actuators of your suspension. And you have the virtual representation of the ECUs, the software, and the way that the software interacts with the hardware in the same model. Those pieces are internal, so we have stuff that comes from GM, we have stuff that comes from suppliers, and we have to be able to integrate those. Complexity landscape in the simulation here. In a physical vehicle, as long as you have one vehicle available as an Iver property, for example, that vehicle can be used for anything. So you can use a vehicle for running vehicle dynamics one day, and NV the next day, drive quality the other day, and at the end you can even crash the vehicle, that's all fine. In the virtual domain, that's still not the reality. We have to develop unique packages depending on the goal of the analysis. So if you're developing a package for 
the driver in the loop, it's going to have a, a certain characteristics that are more important for that kind of utilization, some others that are less important, and you have to find the right balance between fidelity and kind of speed of the model that you're trying to obtain there. What this creates is that we have for any vehicle that we develop today, we have between a dozen and 20 different packages that are necessary to comprehend the full spectrum of performance for the vehicle. And those packages, they evolve over time. So we start with very early development with behavioral controllers, behavioral models for the physics, and then you evolve to, uh, for the calibration stages until you have the final product there modeled in the virtual environment. This for one tracking vehicle. If you think about all the different variants, all the different options that we have in any vehicle architecture, you're talking about possibly hundreds of potential combinations here. Uh, we don't necessarily advocate that we need to do a full factorial exercise here. We don't do that in the physical environment. We don't kind of necessarily need to test every single buildable configuration, but we gotta do much better uh, than we do today in the virtual domain to be able to get to this, uh, uh, to this vision here. Supplier integration. Well, today the process that we have with suppliers is that we build a physical prototype, can be a mule, can be an Iver, can be a kind of a, an APPV vehicle. We either invite suppliers to work with us in, in our proving ground to kind of develop the stuff they are responsible for, or they borrow those uh, units from us and do their development in their own facilities. The thing is, we're gonna have to find ways to trans translate this work into something that can work virtually here. Some obvious downsides uh, of this approach that we have today, well, we can only start working when you have the vehicles, and that may be very late in the development process. Uh, you have risk of late findings. If you find something that you didn't expect at that point, it, it's gonna be late, it's gonna be expensive to fix, and does not allow for much time compression in the development process. If you have to keep building uh, prototype tooling uh, and then assembly the prototypes and do all the checks that are necessary for that is going to take a very long time. So 100% virtual, virtual process here would allow us to kind of uh, get this thing in a much a more uh, kind of streamlined way. We can uh, have integration possible from day one. Uh, we have f the opportunity to find issues much earlier in the process and we can improve aspects of concurrent engineering, meaning that we can have different suppliers, different teams at GM working with the same model at the same time. And here's one thing that, that does not change with the vision is that, well, if we are partnering with different suppliers and they are responsible for development or calibration of their parts, we want them to keep being responsible for that, but in a virtual, uh, virtual environment. And obviously there are some, some challenges with that, which I talk about here. Um, Technical solutions need to become mainstream. So we have like a computational access to different uh, teams to do uh, this kind of co-development in a place where we can protect uh, IP from the different parties, but still allow them to work as they use the vehicle today. Um, this is something that there are advanced in this kind of technology, but we still need to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to make many more, much more progress here to get where we need to be. There are cool things going on. Like uh, I know that VR Grade, for example, is working on AI solutions to allow for uh, long distance uh, kind of hardware in the loop or driving the loop scenarios. This is the kind of technology that is, uh, could allow us to get there. GM is investing uh, time and effort to create a, a cloud system that would allow different um, uh, partners to work in the same environment. The pieces are there. We need to put them together and make them work with this purpose. Um, IP protection obviously need attention um, in a physical vehicle, it's less of a concern, uh, but uh, in a virtual domain, we're gonna have to be very mindful about the fact that, well, if I'm sharing stuff from different uh, partners here with each other, how are we guaranteeing that we are not exposing something that is not supposed to be exposed? Um, we have to have rigor with deliverables here. In a 100% virtual uh, development process, the same level of rigor that we have to build any physical part for development needs to be there for the virtual assets. This is still some of a, somehow of a journey here for us, uh, but we have to get there. And uh, uh, we have to enable virtual exploration here. We have to allow for folks to be able to kind of uh, ask as many questions as are necessary to get us the right answers using the virtual process. Um, 
It can be through a DFMEA kind of approach. It can be by collaboration, using the experience for the folks that are doing this development today in the harbor uh, side. Uh, we need to get that into the virtual domain. Some final considerations here. Uh, we need update to update tools and processes here. So uh, what was acceptable until very recently in terms of quality of the virtual tools might no longer make the cut for the future. Um, we have to kind of uh, have tools that are flexible to, to allow to connect different um, uh, systems and different uh, uh, assets from different partners. So we cannot say that, well, this, this tool here, we are only going to use this tool from uh, vendor A or vendor B because it might not be the tool that our partners are using. It might not be the right tool for them to develop their, their systems in the virtual domain. We have to uh, allow for connectivity, so standardizations, FMU, FMI standards as one key example of that, Autosarfer as another example of that, are really important for us to get there. Uh, Real-time capability is ex uh, extremely relevant. We have to allow full connectivity without losing real-time uh, uh, behavior that would allow us to put the driver inside of the loop. And all partners need to realize value from this. So we don't want this to become something that is only, only the OEM is benefiting from that. That's clearly not the case. We want to implement a vision here where everyone that is developing their product to the final vehicle can benefit from using the virtual environment to get their products done faster, cheaper, and more reliably to the customer. So that's all I had. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate it. We've got time for one question out there. If somebody's got a question for Danielle before we go on. There was one. Danielle, one of the things that I took away from your presentation was you talked about needing to update the methods and the technologies inside of GM today. Can you give me an example of, the, of, of what those types of things are that you're going to have to try to focus on to, to move to simulators forward? Some of the things that we have to work on right now, we have tools that are kind of a very capable to work in their silos. Um, so you have, for example, a, a tool that can work really well to develop pure vehicle dynamics, but you also need a vehicle dynamics engine to drive, to do drive quality. You need that to do uh, powertrain propulsion uh, development. And uh, in order to do that in an efficient way, we have to find the right interfaces and the right tools to get us there. Uh, real time is still a constraint in many cases. So like uh, we, this, the amount of things that we bring into a driver in the loop scenario is sometimes a limitation of what can or cannot be done there. And uh, we have to kind of find alternatives to get tools that are gonna get us the results um, that we need um, uh, in real time with more content that would be required to develop different things than we are doing today. I think Murray talked about the fact that, well, some of the limitations we had with RIDE, for example, some of them are related to the actuators of the systems, uh, which are evolving over time, but some of them are related to the content of the model that is equally important to that purpose. So that those are the things that we have to improve in the models to get us to where we need to be. Great. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny Viella from General Motors, thank you.